Genesis 36 with me tonight, please. Genesis 36. And verse number 12. Genesis 36, 12. And Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son. And she bare to Eliphaz Amalek. And there were the sons, these were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. Father, bless your holy word now, Lord. Bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can go ahead and see it. You'll read when you study the Bible a lot of things in the Old Testament that belong there, but they don't belong here. And if you have a concubine, you need to get right with God. Amen. Period. Period. Matthew chapter 19, he told them, he said, male and female created he them, one man, one woman, that makes up a family. Anything from that is a deviation. But there's a reason for all this stuff in the Old Testament. For one thing, it makes me love the Bible because it tells the truth. The Bible tells you the truth, folks. It's going to tell you the truth. It's not going to sugarcoat its heroes and try to make them into some kind of uh, demigods or whatever. They're real people living in a, world, in a real world for their time, the contemporary age that they lived in. It's important to understand that. It's one of the greatest truths in understanding history is that what was it like during that time? And that's what you get with the concubine. I want to call your attention to, though, the fact that we have Amalek. Now, notice Amalek, Amalek is born of a concubine. And notice it says, And Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, and to Eliphaz, Esau's son. So Amalek is a direct descendant of Esau. Notice carefully. And who was Esau? Well, the Bible tells you who he was. What did he do with his birthright? He sold it, sold it for a bowl of pottage. It didn't mean anything to him. Give not that which is holy to the dogs, cast not your pearls before swine. You have to understand what's precious and what's valuable. Where do you get that from, preacher? You get it from God. And that's very important to understand the simple principle that Esau despised his birthright. And the birthright was a very important thing for that period of time. It was the beginning of the strength and a lot of things went with it, uh, priesthood of the home and, uh, and a double portion of the spirit and all that. And that went with the birthright. But if you'll notice, Amalek now is the son of a concubine and he's the grandson of Esau. And Esau sold his birthright and gave it away. Now Esau's name is also called Edom. And Edom means, in Hebrew, it means red. Edom, red. So Esau, here we see him, with Amalek. Now, of course, he brought sorrow to his father and mother because he went out and he took of, uh, of these, of these uh, married wives of these people and concubines. The Bible says in Genesis 36, verse 16, Duke Korah, Duke Gotham, and Duke Amalek. These are the dukes that came to Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These were the sons of Ada. And then it says in Exodus chapter 17 and verse number 8, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Now here's, here's the picture. Israel has been in captivity for 400 years, generation after generation after generation. You have these people that are born in Egypt and all they've known is slavery. Joshua, for example, and many others. That's all they've ever known is slavery. And so they come out of Egypt and they come out and they have stragglers, they have old, they have weak, they have infirm, they have, they have people in, the, in this millions that are coming out that is simply hard to keep up with with the with the group and they're tired and they are and they are vulnerable that's when Amalek struck them and God's not happy with it first Samuel chapter 15 verse 2 it says thus saith the Lord of hosts I remember that which Amalek did to Israel how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. So this is rough stuff, isn't it? This is rough. You've got to remember, once again, as I told you, Israel now is fighting for survival. 
It's not a matter of conquest, as some would say, or hegemony, where you have a country that's trying to protect its borders and reach out and so forth. No, we have a country that is fighting for its very survival in the midst of enemies. Notice carefully now what the Bible says about Amalek. It says that it's the enemy of his people. Exodus chapter number 17, verse 16, the scripture says, For he said, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. God will never make peace with them. Never make peace with Amalek. This is what's called a war of attrition. What's a war of attrition? A war of attrition is when you have constant struggle by raids and by small groups and so forth. You're not meeting on the battlefield with two armies, 50,000 here, 100,000 here, 50,000 there, 100,000 there. You're not meeting with two armies. You have attrition. This is what was going on uh, in the, in the, right before the Six-Day War with Israel. They were, being, they were suffering attrition in the, in the Sinai Peninsula. So this attrition simply means that God will have war with Amalek from generation to generation, and it'll never cease. Now, Numbers chapter 24 and verse number 15, we have a very interesting thing that's said about Amalek. And here we have Balaam, a prophet, and Balak, who is the king of Moab, wants to get Balaam to cast a curse upon Israel. Why? Because they had heard that Israel covered the whole land. Balak said, there's, to, to paraphrase him, there's many as the sand of the sea. And they're going to overrun us. We've got to do something about these people. So he tried to get Balaam to curse them. And here's what happens. In uh, Numbers 24 verse 15. He took up this parable and said, Balaam the son of Beor hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, He hath said which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. I shall see him, but not now. Now think about this. He's looking thousands of years into the future. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheph. And Balak had just tried to get him to curse Israel. He comes back with a prophecy that says, God's going to smite you, Moab. <clears throat> but he gives this great prophecy, the star out of Jacob and the scepter uh, shall rise out of Israel. Verse 18, and Edom shall be a possession. Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies. And Israel should, shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. Now look at Amalek, verse 20. And when he looked on Amalek, he took up this parable and said, Amalek was the first among the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. God will be finished with him. There will come a time when God is done with Amalek. Now I want you to notice three big enemies of Israel. He had many but three of the big ones. The one you just read about is Amalek. Amalek is an enemy of opportunity. That's the kind of enemy he is. He smites you at your weakest moment. You adversary the devil's a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You look up that Greek word devour, it literally means, have you, have you ever seen a crocodile swallow something whole? That's exactly what that word means. He wants to take hold of you, and he wants to swallow you whole. Nothing left but a shell, an empty shell. The Greek word katapino is the word translated uh, devour. It's to drink down, to gulp entire, devour, drown, swallow up. You ever felt like the devil swallowed you up? Have you ever felt like an empty shell? You ever felt like there's nothing left? Well, you may have fallen into the hands of the devil, and that's what he wants to do with you, to destroy you. You'll have no faith, no hope, no joy. Be like a walking dead man. A lot of people like that commit suicide. I've known quite a few of them down through the years in pastoring a church. I've been to the funerals of brethren that have committed suicide. 
They just can't deal with it. First Peter chapter number 5 and verse 9 says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith. Now listen carefully to the text. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. This is in the same context to be sober because your adversary the devil walketh about seeking whom he may devour. All right? Resist steadfast in the faith. Faith is able to see through the fog. Faith can see through the circumstances. Faith can see past the obstacles. Faith can reach in where nothing else can and take hold of the mighty hand of God. Now look carefully at what he said. He said, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. The Bible says in the book of James that sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Well, the word translated accomplished here and finished there, practically the same word, come from the same family. Think about it. You live in a world that's cursed. There is a God of this world, and it's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And according to the book of James, sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So you are in a constant struggle with death day in and day out because of the curse that is put upon this world. Notice that it says, accomplished. So there is this constant struggle for spiritual survival in the midst of a pagan, pagan, barbaric generation. It's a big deal. Because the same afflictions happen to the unbeliever that happens to the believer. Same thing. Don't ever let some name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, prosperity preacher tell you that it's God's will for you to always be rich and to be healthy. Not according to the scripture. Peter talked about those who suffer according to the will of God. We don't seek that. We seek God. God takes care of that part. One of the greatest truths that I learned when God saved me, it took me a long time to learn this. There are certain things that I leave alone. I let God handle it. Just like when I preach, it's not up to me as to who gets saved. I've done my job. I'm the messenger. It's gone forth. Then it is in the hands of the Almighty. Amen. Same with healing. Same with the work. Same with faith. Same with your life. The same with you face what you face. We all hurt, folks. We all suffer. We all go through hard times. Some of you are going through harder times tonight than others are. Some of you are on top of a mountain. You're shouting. Shout on. Amen. Have a time of it. <laughs> because it won't be long, probably, before you won't be on top of that mountain. I hope not. I hope you can stay up there. I've lived long enough, buddy, to get away from as much suffering and sorrow as I can. Believe me. But I know life. And I know how things go. So this is to drink down. I thought that was quite an illust illustrative thing. It'll literally consume you. That's who he's, what he wants to do. He wants to take you. Now, Amalek is the enemy of opportunity. Babylon is the enemy of intellectualism, science, falsely so-called, which creates confusion. One of the reasons so many people out here walk in the streets and they have nothing to do with the church, nothing to do with God, is because they've been brainwashed in the evolution factory that they call the school system. They've been brainwashed. They can't, they're incapable of objective thinking, and that's the worst thing. That's worse than being brainwashed. If you're capable of objective thinking, you can do some research for yourself. First thing you need to learn in school is learn how to read. Learn how to read. When I was in K-5, no, it wasn't K-5. When I was in first grade, they didn't, I, didn't, I didn't go to K-5. I graduated fast. They put me in the first grade. And first thing they did was teach us the alphabet. Then they taught us how to put letters together and form words. Then they taught us how to put words together and form sentences. Then they taught us how to put sentences together and, 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 and give a concept. A message. What goes in this paragraph. And so forth. And on and on it goes. I've always loved literature from day one. Loved it. And reading started with me. I had no trouble at all learning to read. When I get into math, two plus two messed me up big time. <laughs> but, the, <laughs> but the reading part, no sweat. Do you some research tonight. If you are an evolutionist, I challenge you. 
I challenge you to dig into it a little bit and find out what you're made out of. If you're an evolutionist, do you know anything about DNA? Think about that for a moment. This body is so complicated. And I've only done a little research into it, but I have done some. I've read about the reproductive system of a female. That's quite a thing. I don't know if you've ever did any, ever did any reading in that or not. But it's quite remarkable as to how that God made a woman to get pregnant and bear a baby nine months later. That's a miracle. It really is. And, there's a, and, and all that goes with it. I read it. Why do I read that? I read it because I want to know something. I read it because I don't take what anybody tells me. I'll dig it out for myself. So Babylon appeals to you intellectually. And notice that God called Abraham out of Babylon. He called him out of Ur of the Chaldees. That's how he dealt with them. Remember, he said, I will destroy Amalek. But I called Abraham out. Here's the third one. That's Egypt. Third major enemy of Israel is Egypt. This is the enemy of bondage and oppression. 400 years. A pharaoh rose up that did not know. And so bondage and oppression. So how did they break the power of the bondage and oppression? God judged their gods. Who's your God? I'll put my God against your God any day of the week. I don't care who your God is. I serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes, I do. And the God that I serve tonight is the only true and living God there is. Oh, he may take me home. I may pass from this world, but make no mistake about it. You'll deal with that God that I serve. Amen. The Bible said, fear not him that can destroy the body. Yea, he said, I forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him that after he hath power to kill can send you to hell. To destroy you in hell. He broke the power of their gods. How did he do that? Blood. Blood sacrifice. That's all it took. Amalek is the enemy of opportunity. Loss makes you vulnerable. Pain makes you vulnerable. Eve was vulnerable. The prodigal son was vulnerable. Gehazi was vulnerable. And in every case, they fell. And they fell because of the power of the enemy. Now let's look at Babylon for just a moment tonight. What does Babylon really represent in the Bible? The word Babylon is an Akkadian word. They say it means the gate of the gods. That's remarkable. You say, I thought it was Babel. Babel in Hebrew means confusion. He confused their language. But you get the Akkadian, which is the old Babylonian. The Akkadian is part of that, cur of that culture and of that time. You've got a ziggurat. How many know what a ziggurat is? When I went to Egypt... Our, the guide pointed out to us, everybody thinks that the only pyramids in Egypt are the, like Cheops or Khufu, the main pier at the, of Geza. Uh, the, the, you know, like this, straight sides up. And, uh, but there are pyramids in Egypt that are step pyramids. And the guide said, they built, these are older. The step pyramid is older than the one that is symmetrical and beautiful and all of that if you know if you consider that said that they built them like this until they learned how to build them like this so in other words the ones that are built like this are older than the one that's built like this in other words the pyramid in egypt that is built like this is built like the ziggurat because that's the way the ziggurat is built it's built in levels terraces up to the top. And when the ziggurat was built under Nimrod, it was built to communicate with the gods. This is why God came down and said in the book of Genesis, chapter number 11, he said, and now nothing will be withheld from them if they set their mind to do it. 
And that's one of the most powerful statements in all the Bible because that has to do with you being made in the image of God. What is man capable of? Think about it tonight. Think about it. Think about it. When Orville Wright, and what was his brother's name? Kitty Hawk, North, uh, Kitty Hawk, Orville and Wilbur, right. When was it, 1902, somewhere in there? They flew just a few feet, but they flew. They flew. All right, now look how they're flying. <coughs> DNA, they found it, they discovered it. Crick and Watson and somebody else back in the 50s. DNA, they've discovered that. Now they're beginning to discover things a little deeper than DNA. What are they doing? They're letting the mind that God gave them open and be used. This, this, this ziggurat, this gate to the gods. I want you to think about what we read in the Bible now. Think about this for a moment. Enoch walked with God and God took him. Now, did Satan see that? Of course he did. Did he know who Enoch was? Of course he did. What about Elijah? Who goes up in a chariot of fire. Did the heavens open and receive Elijah? Certainly they did. What about Jacob's ladder? Did the heavens open? Angels ascending and descending on that ladder? Or was that just some kind of a bad dream that Jacob had? No. The heavens opened. In other words, a dimension opened. Let me explain something to you. And I'm sure you all know this anyway already. There's three heavens. The first heaven, you're breathing the air of it. Second heaven, stars, the creation out there that can be seen by the Hubble telescope and so forth. Third heaven that John talks about in Revelation cannot be accessed by a rocket or by any physical means. The third heaven can only be accessed if God opens the door. In other words, that third heaven will allow you to go into the abode of the Almighty. Where is that? Nobody knows. I don't have a clue. I have no idea, but I know that's where God is. In other words, I could drop to the floor here, pass away in the next few minutes, and where does my spirit and my soul go? They go to the first heaven, second heaven, or where? They go to the third heaven immediately, into the third heaven, into the presence of God. So, Satan is conscious, he's aware he, of these things that I just told you about. Have you read in the book of Revelation where the angel comes down with the key to the bottomless pit? The bottomless pit is hell, folks. Alright, who's in the bottomless pit? Not fleshly bodies. See? Not fleshly bodies, but the soul and the spirit of the ungodly when they pass on. But the key, the angel can come down with the key and open it. And it, they'll pass from that dimension that they're in now of the soul and spirit and come back into the dimension of living human beings. And that's what happens in Revelation. They come up out of the pit and they go out on the face of the earth. That's a scary thing, isn't it? How many's ever heard of Sedona, Arizona? Most of you have, so I'm sure you've done reading on your own. Sedona, Arizona is supposed to have a lot of vortexes. What's a vortex? A vortex is an area that has supernatural strength, supernatural presence. Uh, people feel things. People sense things. People get inspired around these vortexes. Sedona is not the only one, but Sedona is one of the famous ones. People come from all over the world to come there. Well, what's the point? The point is that Sedona is supposed to be a gate to the gods. How many of you know what CERN is? Uh -huh. Serenos. All right, over there in Switzerland. A large Hadron Collider, 17 miles in circumference, 300 feet under the ground. They're shooting these particles of proton, protons and whatever else they're shooting at the speed of light, and then they cause them to uh, collide. They say to us that at the moment of collision, they read what happens, and that helps them formulate the Big Bang. Because, see, they're having a bang. 
And so the idea is, if you're an evolutionist, that all of a sudden, somewhere in eternity past, somewhere, sometime, someplace, with nobody knows where, that nothing that did exist, and all of a sudden it did exist, and it collided, and then bang, we've got all of this creation around us. There are people with PhDs that believe that. But they've got an image of Shiva in front of that place. And there are videos on the internet showing these people dancing around Shiva. And Shiva is one of the, one of the great Trinitarian gods of Hinduism. Shiva is the god of destruction and protection. Brahma is the god of creation. And Vishnu is the god of perpetuation or, or continuation. Now, of course, you and I both know there's only one God. And He is not only the protector, He is the creator, and He is the Savior, and He's the Redeemer. He's all of that. But why in the world would a so-called scientific place put something like that out in front of it? And how many have seen the logo of CERN? If you've seen their logo, what's it got on it? Six. Six, six. It's in a unique way. It's not just three numbers laid out, but the numbers come together. The zero part of the numbers are in one place, and then the, the, uh, the top part goes around. Six, six, six. Why would they do that? One of the, the head of CERN said that we may open up a portal into another dimension, and we may go through that portal, or something may come. To us through that portal. You say, well, he's just a raving lunatic. No, he's not. No, he's not. The purpose of that thing is to access the gates to the gods. When you cross that line, you open up a wickedness that this world has never seen. That's why it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, He that letteth will let till he be taken out of the way. In other words, the Holy Ghost is holding back the hordes of hell. In the book of Revelation, you'll find that we have armies moving and three unclean spirits like frogs. Go out of the mouth of beasts, the dragon, the false prophet. These three unclean spirits are demons. This world now is digging deep into demonic possession. That's where it's headed. That's where it's headed. No question about it. My mind, none whatsoever. That means that we had better get serious about praying. We better get serious about that which is real. About calling on the name of the Lord for our loved ones. Jude said, with some make a difference. Pulling them out of the fire. Snatching them from the fire, from the flames. That's quite a thought. Do we have that kind of authority? He said in Matthew chapter 16 to Peter and the apostles, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You got the keys. Then in the book of John, right before he left, he says to his disciples, he said, whosoever sins you retain, they shall be retained. And whosoever sins that you charge shall be charged. And you'll find a thousand Baptist preachers and 999 of them won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. What does that mean? What's it mean? <laughs> That's the Bible, just like anything else is the Bible. We may not understand the full implications of it, but I believe it and I accept it. If you're a true Bible believer, you will too, whether you understand it or not. In plainer words, to the church has been given enormous authority and power. We live in a world that makes fun of the church, laughs at the church. They think the church is just, you've got governors all over this country. They open up the beer joints and they open up the, the dance halls and they open up everything else and they shut down the churches. You've seen them. They've played their hand. I hope you remember come election day who they are. Throw the dirty, stinking politician out where he belongs. He or she. 
and then put someone back in there who, they don't have to be a Bible-believing King James Christian. I would that they were. But at least be a patriotic American that believes in the Constitution. I'd be happy if we had that. Others make a difference, pulling them out of the fire. Your adversary, the devil, as a walking, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. I'll close with this part tonight. How many of you have heard of Nimrod? All right. The Bible said Nimrod was a mighty man. That Hebrew word mighty is gibor. What does that mean? That means fully matured, and it could mean giant. Could mean giant. In plain words, Nimrod might have had something happen to him, like when the sons of God came down to the daughters of men in Genesis 6, that made him head and shoulders like a Goliath above all around him and gave him the charisma that he needed and the power that he needed because his power came from Satan and he was able to lead the people in the first organized rebellion against God. Men had always been sinners, but this in Genesis 11 is the first organized rebellion against God. Nimrod becomes a type of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is coming. He's probably alive right now on this earth. Probably alive right now. If we really believe tonight that we are that close to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what it ought to do? It ought to fill us with joy. It ought to. We ought to get excited. How many of you have seen enough out here in this world to think to yourself, I never imagined I'd even see what I'm seeing now. And it's going to get worse. Yes, it is. It's going to get worse. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. In other words, deceiving each other. You're watching it. You're watching it develop. And I'll tell you right now, folks, you know, just a few months ago, I'm very careful when I talk about the coming of the Lord and the rapture of the church, things like that. I'm careful about it. You know why I am? Because I've seen so much of this in the past, so many books written on prophecy that's not worth the paper they're written on. So much of it's just pure junk. But I'm a watcher. <laughs> I watch. I observe. I pray. And I see trends. I see things developing. I see the, this, this nation right here, this nation, would take the mark of the beast in a heartbeat and laugh in your face when they did it. How many believe that? They would. Forty years ago when I started pastoring, I would, I would never have believed that. Because back then the message was always, millions missing, how are we going to explain it? Well, it won't be as hard to explain if you don't have millions missing. He's coming the second time without sin into salvation for those that look for his appearing. They say that over 50% of all the people in the churches believe that it's okay to, uh, to uh, shack up. For any. How many ever heard the word shack up? Do you know what shack up means? People, you, don't, you never hear anybody talking about shack up. That's what they used to call it when I was a boy. That's two people living together out of wedlock. All right? Now, over 50% of the people in the churches that go to church every Sunday believe it's okay. Over 30%, one out of three, of all the reverends standing in the pulpit in America right now deny the virgin birth of Christ, the deity. They deny his deity. Are they ready? They're ready. They're ready. They're ready to take the mark. Because they're going to be left behind. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I don't, I don't like to suffer. I don't like to hurt. I don't like to see my loved ones hurt. I don't like to see them suffer. And when you get to a place where you see people around you that you love dearly and you watch them suffer, and you see things happening in this world and you know you can't do anything about it, it builds within you a desire to see the Lord come back. I have a desire for the Lord to come back. Somebody said, well, now, preacher, I've got a young child. I've got a child. They, they've got their whole life in front of them. What life? Amen. Not in this country. 
not in this place. If this election in November goes to the Democrats, you wouldn't want to live here. No, you don't. You don't want to live here. You think Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, Minneapolis, uh, what's that other place, Wisconsin up there, uh, little town in Wisconsin, <laughs> Kenosha, thank you, <clears throat> now Los Angeles, and all over the country, it's just the beginning, just the beginning. And get online, I did this yesterday, I was looking for 38 Special, 38 Special, very common round. You cannot find 38 Special anywhere. So I said, I'll look for 9mm. And so when I looked for 9mm, same thing. I thought, all right, 45, Colt 45. Let's see what I find. Not a thing. I said, well, how about Colt uh, 1911? You know, the Colt, Colt automatic. See, the Colt 45 is the old Western gun. Then the short one is the automatic, 1911. Not a bit. I thought, well, let's get 308. Good night, man. We can find. How about shotguns? <laughs> so what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying you cannot get online and find anything. Why? People are arming themselves. The worst thing you, a politician could try to do today is get up in front of people and say, we're going to take your guns away like that guy did down there in Texas. Remember him? He said he's going to take the AR-15s. He's going to take it away. You're toast immediately. Isn't that sad? You live in a country where you've got to arm yourself and you don't know what's going to happen. Perilous times have come. Not will come. They're here now. Father, in thy name I pray. I pray you'd use this tonight. Help us. We look at the things which are not seen because what we see around us and we do see, we don't like we don't like the way it's headed. We don't like it. And so even so, Lord Jesus, even so come. And help us to be true and faithful until you come to get us. We pray for our little ones. Lord, our little children. Our Father, we know they're going to be cheated out of what we had. They'll never be able to grow up in the kind of country that we did. They're going to be cheated out of it. And we pray for them, though, Father, because you're a good God and a gracious God. We pray for them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.